So uh, I have to ask you first, Eugene, when you were a PhD student here, you got your PhD student in 2009, did an you, MBA. An MBA. MBA. Did you envision <laughs> yourself coming back to a room jam-packed with more people than I've ever seen in one of our classrooms, <laughs> with an overflow room as well on the other side uh, of Harper Center? No, it's but, nice, nice to be back. Yeah. It, a lot of deja vu walking, yeah. walking down here. This yeah. is what it's normally like for you when you speak in front of classrooms? <laughs> yeah. um, so can you tell us a little bit, just to sort of set the stage, about how you got involved in this. You're an accounting PhD student here. How did you start interviewing corporate felons? Yeah, so I think like any good PhD student here, I'm, I'm up late in the night working on my dissertation, uh, running regressions. I'm an empirical guy at heart. And I was watching three in the morning, struggling to stay awake. I, I came across a show called MSNBC Lockup. Great, if you're up at three in the morning, great show. It's on still every night. It's like a cross between a reality and documentary television show. And I was watching this, struggling to stay awake, and, and was thinking not about these people on the show were being interviewed about the violent crimes they, they committed. And I was thinking, I'm a financial economist at heart. What, what would the people say, the CEO of Enron, uh, the people from Tyco, WorldCom, the cases that were frequently at the news at the time, what would they say if they were on the show and they were talking? And so as a total personal interest, my, this isn't a scholarly endeavor. This wasn't intellectual exercise out of my own personal interest. I think like many people, when you're reading about these cases, these just extraordinary individuals that are often here for commencement on the cover of Fortune, I just wrote them the first 10 questions that came top of my mind, just sent them off. It's actually very easy to find their addresses online. It's one of the <laughs> very efficient federal government website for this. Uh, and uh, a couple months later, I went back to my empirical work, thinking nothing of it. But then a couple months later, PhD office here, this is my, my mailbox, uh, they started sending me letters here. Uh, and some said, you know, I'll respond, you know, in a brief one pager. But other people, like the CEO of Tyco, said, "Be happy to chat. Just come visit me." Uh, and then slowly but surely, uh, more out of personal interest than anything else, I started to take them up on on this offer. Mm -hmm. So you said one thing in your book that I thought was just really, really profound. Um, and you said that we often think about crime from the victim's perspective and not from the perpetrator's perspective. And that seems particularly true in these cases of corporate crime where you learn about something bad that somebody did and you see potential damage down the road. But it really seems to make a, a it's a really fundamental difference when you change perspective and think about it from the perpetrator's perspective here rather than on the victim's perspective. You tell us why that really seems to matter, why that's such a fundamental shift. Yeah, from the Victims' perspective, these are some of the most traumatic, significant events in their life. Someone might have taken your entire retirement account. And people expect or think that their emotion, they, they cast that on the person perpetrating. If this person did this to me, they must have had that intent. They must have been trying to, to harm me. But if you think of white collar crime, it, it's very different than these kind of close, visceral, violent offenses in that. You're not trying to actually harm the individual. That's never the intent of a white collar crime. That's a connected externality that happens inevitably in these acts. But a as I kind of argue in the book, uh, oftentimes the people that are perpetrating these acts have little or no emotion at the time that what they're doing is actually sinister uh, guilt or, or feeling that they're any actually doing anything that harmful. Mm -hmm. So it, it, even as a society, it seems like we've struggled with this a bit. One of the things I was really surprised to learn in detail from your book was how relatively recent it is that we've even prosecuted white collar crime. So you identify a turning point um, in, a, uh, in kind of the, the way people think about crime. You identify this turning point in this talk uh, from 1939 by the sociologist Edwin Sutherland who makes this academic talk that actually has ends up having really big practical implications. But before that time, like white collar crime wasn't prosecuted. It wasn't even considered something that people did. That seems it, crazy. Uh, it had to be something just truly egregious uh, to, uh, in, or something having to do with food safety or something very personal. But by and large, if you go early, early, 19th, uh, early 20th century, people didn't do crime in the business suites. You just didn't do criminal conduct. That was something you did on the street. And was it because yeah. the people didn't consider what happened in the business suite to be a crime, that it didn't have harm? 
Well, there was a number, number of circumstances. There wasn't necessarily the regulation in place that actually made it illicit. But uh, what Edwin Sutherland laid out in this speech, December 27, 1939, it's a very distinct day which he labeled this, generally there still wasn't that kind of that moral outrage. And this still happened even mid 20th century. Uh, one of the cases which I find most just extraordinary is there was this big price, price fixing scandal during the 1960s. So actually several decades after this. Uh, executives for, from several dozen leading companies, GE, Westinghouse, were actually, by Attorney General Kennedy, put, placed in prison for a couple months. Um, two things were interesting about this. The first, that the defense actually argued why his client from GE shouldn't go to prison is not because they didn't do it, not because it was not, wasn't so bad, but because you don't lock up an executive in the same place where there's pimps and prostitutes. That was his defense of why you shouldn't lock up someone. Uh, which like, ah, that's, a, that's an innovative defense. Um, the second is actually, actually, after the executives came out of prison, they spent three months, so small in the length of sanctions by today's standpoint, the CEO of Westinghouse issued a press release saying that these men, whatever they did, it was in the past, they did something wrong, but these are fine, upstanding men, leaders of their, their country club and their community, so they hired them back in the exact same position as if it was like a three-month kind of sabbatical. Sabbatical, yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, and that's how people accepted it. Uh, and actually, it, they did a survey at Wharton soon after, of actually the MBA students at Wharton, about would they have dealt with this differently. In 1960, um, I think it's something like 70% of students said they would not have fired these people uh, after coming out of prison. So you can just see, I, I suspect if we were to play that survey differently now, more people would probably fire the executives. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> do you see this as a, the change over time, as something that has been kind of the fundamental to regulations and so on? Or do you think there's been an, a, a real shift in how people think about <coughs> corporate crime and the harm that corporations can do? I think there's ha there has been a moral shift of what people actually think is, is moral and immoral. I mean, we see this the Occupy Wall Street. I mean, that was the sense that there were actions, and President Obama was put on the defense in this case, of saying that there were things that were, may have been unethical, but were not illegal. And then this is where you see actually regulators saying, okay, then if there are things that are unethical, maybe this is where we need to design regulation to actually punish people to the extent that, but this is why we're developing new regulation uh, all the time, but simultaneously the people actually perpetrating some of these offenses think you know, one step even further mm -hmm. beyond that. Mm -hmm. So we can't have a conversation about crime at the University of Chicago without talking about Gary Becker. Uh, at least his theory of crime, not meaning to imply he was a criminal. <laughs> uh, his theory of crime. And <coughs> He argued that, that crime can be thought of as a rational act by the person who commits the crime. Um, but there's a really important component to Gary's definition of rationality that, as a psychologist, we care a lot about. That is, he argued that people behave in a way that's welfare maximizing as they perceive it. As they perceive it. So it becomes a question of psychology, of your own perception of the world. And there are then two ways in which you could get people behaving in ways that aren't welfare maximizing. But uh, one would be that they don't do the actual calculations that Gary Becker and others who articulate these rational economic models suggest. The other is that they do some of this, but their expectations are wrong. That is, their perception about what would be welfare maximizing is just misguided. So let's maybe talk about the first of those. Um, you come down as being a little skeptical about uh, uh, that, that these, these folks you talked with are doing this kind of welfare maximizing calculation. Explain what, what you found when you talked to people. So first, uh, around kind of Gary Becker, because I mean, it's one of the classes I was, had the greatest privilege of taking when I was a doctoral student, uh, uh, Professor Becker's classes, Kevin Murphy's classes. Um, but they were very careful, and if you look at Gary Becker's early work on this topic of economic crime, very clear that this is a, a, a model, a set of models to predict behavior. It wasn't a psychological model. Actually, they wrote a very kind of a snarky little line saying that they don't have time to talk about whether this is actually has to do with psychology. But this predicts behavior. Um, <laughs> and, but it was one of the things that's interesting, after that paper over the preceding kind of the, the decades, the following decade, two decades, it transformed from an, an academic mathematical model to a model of psychology, kind of the economists took over your world, uh, maybe and nudged into it. And we, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and this is became how prosecutors, regulators started thinking that because you could describe it mathematically, this is how people actually made decisions. Um, and it, it's kind of a, it's something at least I found surprising, kind of documenting how the, those changes, changes took place. Because what I entered, and maybe this is 
what one does after you get a PhD from here and you spend a lot of time thinking about this. Let's look at how their people are making decisions. Um, are, they, are they weighing their decisions in a way that they think they're just never going to be caught, the benefits are, uh, costs are really low, that the benefits are just so high from their reputation or something else. And so when I started some of these conversations with people, I was seeking to try to understand a little bit more about how they might be weighing different things. And I think what I found frustrating after you start talking with people enough is that some of the decisions that they were making just couldn't map into any, any reasonable model in that case. We could make a very fancy mathematical model to try to represent that. But I mean, ta let's take an example. Uh, Raja Gupta, uh, former head of McKinsey. I mean, he calls 23 seconds after a uh, board meeting, a Goldman Sachs board meeting, to divulge some private information to a, a well-known hedge fund trader. This doesn't take a, a, a tremendous amount of kind of calculation to figure out that well, you're probably going to be caught in these. Uh, insider trading is actually something where you have a very high chance of being caught. So it doesn't look like there was actually a lot of deliberation. I mean, there was actually 23 seconds. We actually know how long. So uh, there wasn't a lot of deliberation. So as you look at a lot of these cases, it doesn't seem to fit as well with this notion of this kind of careful, deliberate, analytical analysis. Yeah. So there was another case that you described that I thought was interesting, uh, Scott London's case. Do you want to? Because this also doesn't yeah. fit into the, into the cost-benefit calculation account that well. Yeah, Scott London, I mean, this is a, a senior partner at KPMG heading the firm's practice for the Western United States. Uh, he had 550 employees under him, 50 partners under him, doing well, $900,000 a year. And he had basically tenure for all practical purposes at $900,000 a year at KPMG, going up nicely. Uh, a, couple f a couple kids also going into accounting. And this is a guy with all of that backdrop that you see, ended up slowly through a couple conversations with an kind of friend or buddy of his, started talking about work, what was stressful in some of the cases. Uh, he was the senior partner on Herbalife, which was under an activist battle for potentially engaging in a Ponzi scheme, which it, it wasn't doing, actually. And uh, he ended up divulging some information to, to an old friend, uh, a friend of his, uh, maybe to help him out, but I think more just as a stress relief of just starting to describe what he was doing, some things that he was proud about, some of the things that he was frustrated about. And ultimately, in return, I mean, it's unambiguous. The FBI actually has a picture of him in a parking lot, t Starbucks parking lot, talking to his old friend of his. And uh, he got a, a watch. Uh, there was a couple thousand dollars of cash that even the FBI admitted he was really reluctant to take. And he was confused when this guy was handing him the cash. And uh, two tickets to a Bruce Springsteen concert. And we can create a very fancy model to say, like, what's a utility associated with Bruce Springsteen? Um, <laughs> But I think most people, it, you're not going to give up a, a $900,000 a year job for presumably two Bruce Steenstein tickets and then go to prison for a year. Um, it's not what he was sitting there in the parking lot thinking of what calculating. Um, there was something else going on. Yeah. You even quote him as saying uh, in your book that, uh, that I never even thought about the costs. Right? That was something that we were talking about this, this morning. How often are these folks thinking that they're going to end up in jail? So my uh, hypothesis, and you know, ultimately one of the challenges work is we, we are looking with the benefit of hindsight trying yeah. to go back, but simultaneously also exploring how they're thinking about other people's cases and their current, current conduct, is that people don't perceive, even when you're doing really funky, funky things, blatantly wrong things, that you're going to end up in prison. And this isn't because I think regulators are ineffective or they, there's no chance of getting caught. I mean, some of the cases like insider trading, you're going to get caught. SEC is actually pretty good at monitoring for insider trading, especially if you were a family member. They just don't see that ever being as a possible outcome, so you're not actually incorporating that into your decision. And so this is Scott London spending time. Scott, can you, can you try to imagine what could you have been thinking in that parking lot? I mean, you were doing something that was so blatant. I mean, this wasn't even a hard case for the FBI and SEC. This was low-hanging fruit for them. They could do it in the afternoon. Um, he, he can't figure out what he was thinking. A and that's the part that's, I think, the, I think the part that I found most interesting trying to reconcile how these individuals who are otherwise so brilliant, you don't become a senior partner at KPMG or McKinsey or any of these firms by, by sheer luck. These are brilliantly smart people who are strategic. But they do things at some points in their life that are otherwise so <coughs> poor in terms yeah. of actually thinking it through. Yeah. Well, one of the things that psychologists know about attention is that it's very limited. And so you think about things that are called to your attention at the time. So when Scott London is standing across from his friend, he's likely thinking about 
helping his friend, not about the consequences of his actions much more broadly. So the other challenge with perception is that it varies from one moment to the next, depending on what you happen to be thinking about. Um, some regulators have suggested that, that shifting this, this perspective a little bit or this perception a little bit is the, is the key to helping curb corporate crime. So Preet Bharara, for instance, the attorney general for uh, Southern New York, who is charged with uh, most of the Wall Street crime anyway, has argued that making these criminal sentences more accessible to people would, would curb some of these crimes. Maybe bring it to the top of mind while they're engaging in these kinds of actions. Given that many of the folks that you talk to don't seem to be making these calculations, does that seem to be a reasonable approach to reducing crime, or is it barking up the wrong tree? Uh, that's a good question, because I actually think most of the regulatory changes over the last three decades is that not actually about making these sanctions more salient, but rather, if you're caught, making the punishment greater. Because as we know, kind of under the economic framework, there's two ways of increasing the expected costs. One is change the likelihood of being caught, or the second thing is actually changing the punishment if caught. Now, changing the likelihood of being caught is very costly. You need to hire more people to go out and be looking for these things. You need to hire more people in firms to teach people what, what's right and wrong. Changing the sanction from, if you get caught from two years to 10 years, is, is pretty easy. And so most of the change is about saying, well, if you're caught, we'll change it from two years to 10 years. And to the extent people were doing this very careful calculation, that would be pretty effective. But you know, as you point out here, Scott Lund in the parking lot is not thinking, well, I just know they just passed some changes that now it's four years as opposed to two. And so now, now I'm adjusting, you know, given the probability. Whereas if there was more effort to change the norm, so this would be popping into people's mind when they were in the parking lot, that this is the kind of stuff we don't do. Uh, as a leader of a firm, I don't do this. Um, but that's a very different kind of regulatory approach and a very costly one, which I don't think we've costly seen. Costly one to increase the likelihood. To, to, increase, to increase the likelihood. So we don't do that. Or at least I'll say over the last several decades, if you hear what the SEC says with the DOJ, if anything, their budgets are increasingly under pressure, suggesting that the people that actually could make this more salient don't actually have the resources available to do that. Interesting. So um, one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned in your book was being surprised that many of the executives don't express remorse for their actions or the harm that they've caused. First off, why were you surprised by that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, why were you surprised by that? So, it's a good, now with the benefit of hindsight, you know, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but uh, I mean, you, these individuals, I mean, across the board, what people have remorse for is that they miss their, their kids' graduation, they miss birthdays, they miss those. And it's, it's remorse for their personal for kind of loss. To the extent that their actions harmed other people, which they did. I mean, to the extent the executive, at the very least, they, people lost their jobs, people lost their retirement plans. That you would expect, or at least I would expect, that you could sit back and say, you know what? It's, I was a leader of a firm, it's because of my actions that 20,000 people now don't have a retirement account and they're 60 and trying desperately to find another job. Um, and what it turned out is that effort of trying to think about what's harm is an intellectual exercise. It's not something they viscerally felt. And I think this was what I kind of teased through the book. And at least what I took away most is when this harm is very distant, it's, it's this abstract thing of like insider trading. It's, it's not present. It's not visceral. You're, you don't feel what you're doing is actually harmful. As a result, you kind of proceed. But even later, it, you don't actually see the ramifications of your actions. It's a very kind of distant, I didn't really do it. Um, it, it happened. Yeah. Um, as a result, you don't feel that much remorse actually associated with this. And that's consistent. That's not just someone with insider trading, but that's financial fraud. That's even the people engaged in Ponzi schemes, which are maybe the most direct type of harm. Yeah, this, this gets back to the comment we were talking about earlier about how long it took us as a society to actually send white collar criminals to jail, to prosecute them. Before then, it was hard to identify the harm. The regulations weren't in place to, to make these things crime. It seems to be very much an individual level uh, kind of psychology that's the same. Yeah, I mean, even regulators see this harm differently. And so the one, one case that I think is pretty interesting is that there's a, a director and investor relations firm. And 
regulators su suspected that he was engaging in, in insider trading. And so what they did was basically have a nighttime sting operation, go into his office, carefully open his briefcase, remove his papers, photocopy them all so they see what kind of insider information he has, close his briefcase carefully, and then the following day wait till he starts insider trading. Now, if this was an act of terror, uh, assault, murder, I would really genuinely hope the regulators don't <laughs> wait till it happens and then <laughs> saying, we, we got him. Uh, <laughs> but with white collar crime, even regulators see this differently, that the harm for insider trading is so diffuse that in order to secure a successful prosecution, in some instances, they would rather it go ahead and happens, providing a very easy case for them to prosecute than actually preventing it ahead of time, um, which actually shows this even today, uh, the reaction. The white collar crime doesn't get us in that, that same way as, as violent offenses do. Yeah, so if you've seen the documentary on Enron, the smartest guys in the room, there's a really, really memorable sequence in that movie where you're hearing from the Enron traders who are fixing the prices on electricity in California by shutting off the power plants. So this is in the summertime in California, it's 110 degrees outside. And they're, they're, they're telling these, uh, these power plants to go down so they can jack up the price on, on electricity. Now, when you turn off the electricity when it's 110 degrees outside, people die, right? Their homes heat up, people lose their lives from this, and people did. Now, if these guys had gone and cut the power cord right outside their houses, that would have been, clearly they would have felt bad about that, and they probably wouldn't have done that. But when they're talking on the phone about this, they're joking about it, referring to Grandma Millie. Uh, they don't seem to have an awareness of the pain they're causing. You tell a really great story uh, in the book. Uh, this is a guy named Steve Garfinkel, who I think probably shows this better than anybody else. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah. So he's a, a chief financial officer at a, a, a basically a financial type entity firm, um, medical equipment. And he, uh, like some of these cases, it starts as a slippery slope. This some issues with some contracts, it starts growing. And he describes how he would just routinely sign these false contracts about how much collateral they had and really thought nothing of it. You know, it was a small violation that got larger and larger. And he said, I didn't really think of it as lying when I, when I would sign the sheets of paper. And then finally, after a couple years of this, someone actually from Goldman Sachs actually was looking at this on a table with him going over it and said he just could, this didn't make sense. He was looking at this, this is doesn't make sense. And in sat there and accused him and basically said, this is wrong. I, I, can you attest? I need you to attest before they basically want some additional capital. I need you to personally attest that this is actually correct. Steve Garfunkel actually leaves the room. He's CFO, goes to tell the CEO that he can't actually lie to this banker in, in, to his face. He, he can't. <laughs> it was OK on paper, but to his face, he can't do it. Set, went back and actually said, you know what, this is, this is actually wrong. Uh, th these numbers of the collateral are, are incorrect. And he said, you know, this is one of the differences of, of lying to someone on a sheet of paper was very easy for him, but lying to someone in the face of something, and it's, at this point, it's, it's when everything unraveled. Um, so in that, I mean, it's one of the most clear examples of the distance, but the proximity between the individual and, and their victim. In this case, it would have been, I guess, bankers. Uh, we're, we're different. Yeah, you told me before we came down here that you spent all this time in prison with these white-collar criminals, and you never worried that they would, like, steal your wallet when you were standing there, even though they've stole millions and millions <laughs> of dollars. Right? They, they probably stole much more from you in whatever you might have had invested in their companies, uh, but you weren't worried about them harming you directly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the difference of the proximity, is that no one's good. I mean, these are reasonably well-socialized, actually very cordial individuals. They're not going to, when I turn around, jack my wallet. But simultaneously, and to many people in here, if you, if you have money in, in any of these large firms, they've taken actually far more for you and, and don't even have remorse for it, uh, which is the part of trying to reconcile what's challenging associated with, with white collar crime and business misconduct more broadly. Yeah, I think it also is important for uh, helping us, all of us in this room, and in the, however other many rooms we now are broadcasting this to, helping us pass the empathy test. That is what you try to do in your book is what I think really good psychology tries to do, which is to allow all of us to understand what it's like to be somebody else, to understand 
what's going through your head at the time when you're making these kinds of decisions that would allow you to recognize that if you were in that situation, in the very same context, you would probably have done something similar, or at least you could understand why somebody would do this. You made a, a good, you, you had a, a couple of chapters on this one in, in particular that I thought helped us do this with insider trading, something that many of the people you talked to had been convicted of. It's one that from the outside seems somewhat clear. You can't trade on privileged information that directly benefits you. That's pretty obvious. And yet, when you're in the midst of it, it's a little bit more challenging to recognize. Can you help us pass the empathy test on insider trading? What's that like to be on the inside? Yeah, I think insider trading is one of the most challenging offenses in that, and to the extent many people in here are going to go in the financial industry, to the extent you, part of your job is acquiring information, uh, acquiring it aggressively. And that, that there's a very, very fine line between when that's successful and then when that turns into something that could be civil or even criminal, a criminal offense. But when you think of the person engaging in insider trading, so whether it's legal or illegal, the intent is really the same in both instances. It's to have better information than someone else. And you can't really relate to the people on the other side. I mean, what's fascinating about insider trading is it, it is a very much of an intellectual crime and in that you can't actually identify the victims. You're on an anonymous securities market. The people on the other side are actually uh, not identified. Actually, I would I say the true victims of people insider trading are, are not even the people you're trading with, but it's actually the people who, had it not been for your trading, are probably excluded from that market. So it's this really abstract offense that no one naturally relates to. Um, and to the extent that spending time with people who engage in insider trading, it's like, it reminds me of like an, a class exam. I mean, you're sitting there trying to piece through of how my action actually could have hurt someone else. Um, it's hard. And you watch the person almost getting like a headache trying to do this with me. Um, they're trying to figure out exactly how this hurt, hurt, hurt someone that I can actually identify. Mm -hmm. And our moral faculties are very tightly attuned to harm. So if you punch somebody in the face, that's clearly harm. We all recognize that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you engage in some kind of trading that steals <coughs> thousands of dollars from somebody who might have made that money down the road, it's hard to empath. It's hard to feel. You can't feel that. Yeah, one of my favorite cases, to the extent I have favorite cases, it's actually civil. This isn't criminal. But it was two years ago, a couple... Uh, traders, basically data analysts tra in, uh, at, at Capital One, the credit card company. Um, they were sitting there processing, looking at the data that was coming through Capital One, and they saw that, or hypothesized, that when people bought more ch burritos at, at Chipotle, uh, when you bought more uh, something, at more pizza at Domino's, that the stock would do better the following month. And they actually did this in a very sophisticated way. What they did was look at millions and millions of credit card statements, run a text analysis, kind of search through it, and actually matched up people's transactions month to month to actually test this hypothesis. This is exactly what you do in you know, a class exercise. This is what you do at a good hedge fund. You take data, you process it in a clever way. Now, they then went out and traded on this. They actually made very quickly a couple hundred thousand dollars within a couple month, uh, months. And uh, this is illicit insider trading. The SEC quick, quickly went after them. Now, what's extraordinary in this case? So that's illegal. That's illicit insider trading. Now, there are two things that they could have done or could have been done which would make this not illicit. Is that Capital One could have actually hired them to trade on Capital One's behalf. Now, if Capital One said, you're doing this and we want you to trade on Capital One's credit card, that's OK. It's Capital One's data. They weren't misappropriating the data. They could have done that. But I'll say even more extraordinary is that if they worked at a hedge fund, another hedge fund, they could have bought this data from Capital One. And in fact, actually, two credit card companies sell this data, but it's with millions of dollars. So to the extent that you work at a hedge fund, you can spend $3 million and buy this data set for Capital One, you can do the exact same transaction. And that's just called you know, making, like making alpha uh, you know, and doing well, uh, <laughs> not, not illegal. So it just shows you how different, like, just depending on where you're sitting, how you acquire information makes something, quote, harmful and the other time makes it something you're going to get like a multi-million dollar paycheck at the end of the year. Uh -huh. right. So given that, how do you make this more accessible to people? I mean, this sounds like a, a super hard problem. If, if none of us want to get arrested for insider trading, which I'll, you don't have to raise your hand, I presume <laughs> nobody wants to be arrested for insider trading, how do we solve this problem? Uh, this is difficult because in the, in the world in which you operate right now, there isn't the degree of uh, intimacy between 
our actions and who they affect. I mean, a couple hundred years ago, this was nice. In business, you, you knew the people you were you know, interacting with. Today, we all, I think, endeavor to work at larger and larger entities in which, by definition, we'll, we'll never know who we impact. So at least how I frame or think about this, which raises this challenging set of questions, is that a lot of the decisions that we see these individuals failing, uh, failing on, and to the extent I'm using failing not in a rational way, but in the failing that this ends up, they end up going to prison, which is probably not what they wanted ex ante, is that in the classroom when we think about these, and we try to do this ourselves, these decisions are very easy, very, very easy. Um, you don't need to spend a pile of time thinking like Raja Gupta. I mean, should you call a hedge fund and give them proprietary information or not? This isn't something you need an hour-long discussion. So the question is, why is it so easy when we're sitting here thinking about these kinds of things, but otherwise so difficult when you're actually in this situation, and you, we see these extraordinary individuals doing things that look with the benefit of hindsight so absolutely stupid? So we can think of like the couple things that make our decisions in the classroom different from, and that is, you know, we're surrounded by people that have different beliefs that we actually discuss and debate things with. We actually turn off and we're not relying on our intuition, which is imperfect when it comes to these kind of distant harms. We're not evolutionary designed to sense distant harm. We're, we're designed very well to see close, intimate harms. Um, and we start to see that those are the things that make it very easy here, but very hard out, out there. So can we try to start designing ways to, to make it a little bit easier, make the world more like what we're doing here? Um, and I think that's the challenging question. Yeah. To, to try to address. The other challenging thing that, that uh, the insider trading example brings up um, we, is not just what you're thinking about at the time of judgment, you're thinking about making money, whatever. Um, there's also this phenomenon that psychologists describe as construal, which is not, not what you happen to be attending to at any given time, but how you interpret what it is that you're attending to. So you pointed out with just a slight tweak, this could have gone from an insider trading case to something where you're just making alpha, you're just making money for the firm. This was really clear too, I think, in the Enron case with Andy Fastow, who was charged with finding creative ways of uh, trying to get some of Enron's debts off of their books. And it seems like in a lot of the cases that you describe, there's really a fundamental construal problem going on. People don't go into it thinking that they're doing something eth ethical or planning to do something ethical. They go into it thinking that they're doing something else. Mm -hmm. Helping a friend, they're being creative, they're finding alpha, they're looking for arbitrage, which ends up, if you look at it from another way, being unethical. Yeah, I think if, if there was a chance that I and I think others in this room would run into to a challenge, I mean, we, we pride ourselves on our cleverness of finding solutions to problems. And you know, I remember the first time you know, I met Andy Fastow in, in person. So it was soon after he got out of prison, I, I went down to Houston and we're sitting there over dinner. Uh, and there was, I guess, this kind of careful balance between he realized what he did is what led to these pretty nasty consequences for him personally and, and his family. But simultaneously, as he thinks back and was recalling, and, and we were discussing them, there was also, uh, you could say, almost a, a, a twinkle of, of pride at how incredibly clever. And I will say, in many of these instances, they were very, very clever. And whether they were illicit or, or not, in some instances, it was actually very fuzzy. I mean, he ultimately pled guilty for, for a number of reasons. But if these were actually litigated, many of these transactions, they actually may have been found legal in some instances. I mean, ultimately, he was convicted for really technical violations. And I think that's the challenge that we face, is that when you start getting into some of these really prestigious jobs where there's financial structuring, tax structuring, where we endeavor to find solutions to problems. And so you don't think of it as an ethical challenge. You don't think of this as something it's going to. But you look at that as, this is my job at the firm to figure out how to solve this. Um, and you, your utility, your excitement comes from solving it. And you don't really think of all the other ramifications that, that this may, may actually have. And I think that's a really difficult challenge. I mean, I'm sure many people in here, when you go into your finance class, you're talking about really complex phenomena and you're thinking it with a finance lens. And then you walk in, you might take a business ethics class or you switch that lens and now you're thinking of, oh, how, how should I make society better off? But you can flip back and forth very easily between those two modes. Um, but the real world doesn't have different modes. Uh, it doesn't have different classes. It's, a, it's all one. Um, but we're pretty ineffective, I think, at actually doing that in real life. Yeah. Well, that's your trigger to do it. Yeah, yeah, Andy, Andy yeah. Fastow, when he was on his apology tour, he's given a few talks since he's been out of 
prison, one of the things that he said uh, in these talks a few times is that I never thought about whether it was right, I just thought about whether it was legal. And there are some firms that prompt you to think about whether something's right. Warren Buffett encourages his employees to think about how they would feel if their action was on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And even Enron, uh, you report, thought of this too. They had what you described as the Wall Street Journal rule. And they even recognized that some of the structured finance that FASTI Fast was doing wouldn't look good on the pages of the Wall Street Journal. But in that case, they went ahead with it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I think the challenge, at least something I realized from this project, is that knowing the difference between right and wrong is not sufficient to, to stop us. I mean, we actually all do things that are, are, that are illicit. I mean, we all speed. That's probably the easiest one. Use tax. If you buy something out of state, you're actually supposed to report that on your state tax return. There's actually what, I mean, most people are surprised by that. That's why Dennis Kozwalski, the CEO of Tyco, I and mean, that's what started everything, all the consequences that he faced. Um, we all do things that are wrong, but we, we figure out ways of rationalizing and moving forward. It's when you actually feel something is harmful that you get that gut instinct to stop and actually not proceed. And this is where we see a lot of pretty sketchy things happening, very tongue in cheek, that people are know are wrong but don't really think anything of it is because it doesn't really resonate in their gut with them. Um, I do the test, I, I, my own like, little version, game that I've tried in my head, driving home. I, I live two miles away from, from school. And I've, I know speeding is wrong, uh, and you know there's a 20 mile an hour speed limit. They're very low in Cambridge, there's lots of schools. And if I consciously think about it, I'll force myself to go from 30 to 20. But intuitively, I never really think anything of going 30. It doesn't resonate in my gut. If I go 30, I know there's, there's, there's potential really serious ramifications. If I was to hit someone because I was rushing, that would look pretty absurd. Um, and it would be terrible, the consequences. But I can't m force myself, when you have this kind of statistical distant harm, to intuitively, viscerally feel that what I'm doing is actually so bad. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the challenge we all face, is we're not well accustomed <coughs> to actually think about those kinds of offenses. Uh, harms when they're far away. Yeah. Most of us, though, are wired to think about harms when they're close, when they're right here. But you describe one person in the book who you've had very lengthy conversations with. Uh, Luigi said maybe you're his only friend or his, his best friend. Uh, and that is Bernie Madoff. And Madoff, from your description, sounds very different uh, from the other people that you describe. Now, obviously, there are different kinds of criminals. Um, what makes Madoff different? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I do throughout the book with all these executives is I think they're much more similar to us than different. But, but Madoff is, is different <coughs> in, a, in a way in that he, unlike others, knew his victims. These were family, these were friends, these were people in the local Jewish community who he intimately, intimately knew. And so, in his case, it's almost kind of the extreme corner solution is why someone, even when you can't when you see the person and they're so close to you, do you not feel what you're doing is actually harmful, which is very different than insider trading or these abstract crimes. What, when you're <laughs> accepting a check from your uh, cousin, why don't you feel it? And in this way, I, I you know, argue and I describe some of our correspondence and phone calls where he has, a, I think, an inability or it's, it's challenging for him to re relate in a deep, empathetic way with others. He's just simply a less empathetic person. Um, that makes him different from, distinctly different from other executives and I think from, from many people more, more broadly, which is, I, I think, part of the, the way he was able to perpetrate this crime for so long is that he didn't feel the same set of, of consequences and reactions while it was actually going, going on. Now, where did you see evidence of this? Uh, so, so I did two things, I guess, in the course of our conversations. The first is, <coughs> I mean, I, I, my goal with this project wasn't simply to to drop in, like helicopter drop in, have an interview, like maybe a journalist. My goal is actually to develop a really, a genuinely relationship with these individuals, to try to step into their shoes and understand how they, they saw the world. And so I tried to get to the point with, with all these people of uh, being able to really push back to, uh, you know, I can call them, call their bluff. When they say something that doesn't make sense, I want to point that out and say, that doesn't make sense. Let's try again. Um, which takes a while to get to that fixed point. Um, and then with him, I did present, I mean, I, I've, I've spoken to a pile of his victims, uh, people that have lost everything. And I basically said, here's my correspondence with them. Look at, look at their life now. And didn't really resonate with him. I mean, uh, the emails are in there back and forth. Of he found a reason that these people shouldn't have been investing with me. Uh, these people sat outside, uh, you know, 
they didn't pass the limit, it's their fault. Uh, we can come up with every possible rationalization. Um, and those are the individuals, and then even with his family. I mean, probably the most, I'll say, eerie conversation I had, uh, and one that impacted me a lot is when, uh, so we, I normally had my conversations with individuals scheduled. Uh, so Bernie made off 7 p.m. Wednesday night, every Wednesday. Uh, and so I, I picked up the phone, and this was a, fr I think it was a Thursday or Friday afternoon. Um, a colleague actually sent me, uh, his second son died uh, and from cancer. And in I picked up the phone, it was a call from a federal prison, I accepted it, and it was actually Bernie Madoff. And he just heard on the radio that his second son passed away and it asked if I could read the obituary. And I'll say at this point of this entire project, it, it's very different. I'm, this is not something you're trained as a graduate student to do by any school. Um, this is not something I, I'm, I've been, I guess, lucky in my life. I've never had to convey that kind of news to, to a father about a child that just died. And so I read him the obituary from Reuters, and uh, you know, I'm at a loss to know what to say to him after. You know, is there anything I can do? And then there was a, a pause, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then let's go back to talking about the Swiss LIBOR rates that we talked about earlier in the week. And for the next 11 minutes, calls are limited to 15 minutes, talking about uh, interest rates. And the following week, our conversation goes back to normal. And I found this, there's something distinctly different. And I don't think this was simply because he was so overwhelmed with grief, which maybe, ha which I it's, this was a highly functional conversation about interest rates. Frankly, I, I was really deeply uncomfortable during this conversation because I felt like I was feeling just more kind of sadness um, than, than he was talking about these highly technical things. Um, and it's at that point that I thought, and this is where I spend more time thinking about, maybe he's just a little bit different than most people. Uh -huh. So psychologists would refer to that as psychopathy, or at least one dimension <laughs> of that. So <laughs> there, there are two dimensions of psychopathy. One is, uh, one is a lack of empathy or a sense of remorse. That is, you could punch somebody in the face and not feel much. Charles Manson is the stereotypical example of, 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 of that, just feeling no empathy or remorse. The other part is, um, is antisocial behavior. Madoff wouldn't necessarily be high on that. These are people who are violent, aggressive, abusive, wouldn't necessarily score high on that, but certainly lacks the empathy, uh, ap empathy component, it seems. So, um, with all, of, with all of this knowledge that you've gained from talking to folks who have made mistakes and have committed these crimes, what would you tell us for how to avoid this ourselves? I don't think anybody in this room wants to uh, find themselves on a wall of shame somewhere having done some act of corporate malfeasance. What do we do to inoculate ourselves from this? Yeah, so the, the last slide I should know when I talk about this in, in my class, I can do this for other, I do it for my, my school, I, I do it for HBS. Actually, I have a slide, I've gone to the Facebook. Well, if it's uh, good advice, book. we'll take so it. If it's not, well, <laughs> <laughs> nah, we'll forget about it. And there's right now around two dozen HBS alum sitting in prison or have recently been in prison. Um, I, I, think, I, I think actually, I think Wharton actually is leading HBS. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago's just slightly behind, but you know, like there, there's always a chance in the future uh, <laughs> of catch, catching up to Wharton. Um, but but it's a, I think the humbling challenge is there's not one person that sits here when, when you're about to finish and you know, go out and, and do things that you're sitting saying, you know what, I'm gonna go out and take what I've learned over the last couple years, enter the financial industry, enter whatever industry, make a pile of money, become a titan of industry, be on the cover of Fortune, be on CNBC, and you know what, after like 20 or 30 years, I think I might engage in some white collar crime. <laughs> and that'd be a nice way to round it out. <laughs> it, no one thinks like that. I mean, I can say that's just a fact. So the question is, well, what happens between that last day when you're sitting here and 20 or 30 years down, down the road? There's something, something has had to change or something because of the pressure, the sets of circumstances. So at least how I've, I've th thought about this is that we don't have a lot of empathy, uh, I mean, uh, humility about the kinds of, I think, challenges that we actually face. To the extent you actually are junior and actually start out, you actually, I think, have a bit more humility that you don't know everything, so you're asking for help. But as you go up higher and higher within that ladder, you actually have less humility and actually you think you're more confident in handling these problems. And I think it's that that we see a lot of these individuals end up failing, failing around. Rather than designing systems that actually might protect them where their weaknesses might, might lie. Um, 
one of my favorite stories, I think, in the book is actually not someone that actually engaged in white collar crime, but it's this guy, venture capitalist, I'm sure many people know, Ben Horowitz, uh, celebrated venture capitalist. And there's a, the, the narrative I tell in that he, engage, he brought on a new CFO for one of his firms, and the CFO said, you know what, a lot of firms in Silicon Valley, what they're doing is they take their option date and they move it around. And they move it so it's more optimal for the executive. This would be known as stock option backdating. <laughs> it was something that all the firms in Silicon Valley were doing. Law firms were suggesting it. Price Waterhouse Cooper, uh, Cooper is a the accounting firm actually signed off on this in a limited context, uh, believe it or not. And so he presented this to, to Ben uh, and said, you know, we should do this. Now, Ben is someone kind of like a Steve Jobs type of visionary, S technology, innovation, strategy. He's not a finance and accounting guy. And so he put a routine procedure in place which said, anytime I'm about to change something that has to do with finance and accounting, my intuitions are not well designed to actually figure out if that's good or bad or really. So he always called someone that was sat outside the firm, sat outside of Silicon Valley, because actually if he would have called a lawyer in Silicon Valley, they would have said, this is a great idea. This is what we're telling all our clients to do. He wanted a view of someone totally different. Um, he called them and he said, I've looked at this six different ways and, and there's no way this is legal. This is an absurd idea. <laughs> you shouldn't do this. And so he went back to the CFO and said, you know what, I know everyone else seems to be doing it. And she brought evidence that a lot of firms were doing this, um, but it's not for us. Two years later, what happens? The investigation begins, uh, Charlene Ad Abrams, um, she did this at her prior firm. She actually ended up going to prison for several months because of this. And as Ben refers, uh, thinks about this, the only reason why he didn't go to prison is because he had the right organizational design. This has nothing to do with having a, a good moral compass, having better values. This simply has to do with the fact that he knew ahead of time where his weaknesses lie and actually designed not really a compliance system, it's like a personal preservation I way of, of anticipating ahead of time and finding a way to get outside counsel, much like if you were here in the classroom, you would have other people to talk with. He designed that even when he was the top of the firm. And I think if we could identify our weaknesses ahead of time or where, depending on what firm you're in, what are the pressures that you might face that you'd be likely to give into and figure out ways of actually creating automatic checks and balances ahead of time, we, we might be able to avoid a little bit more of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. excellent. So with that, why don't we turn it over to you guys. I believe there's a microphone somewhere. Luigi's <laughs> hanging on to the microphone. Yes, raise your microphone. All right. Who has questions? There's one right here. Uh, so you talk a lot about how people are able to do these things without seeing the virtual harm. Mm -hmm. And so interested in, are there ways to take away that abstraction so that people will actually do see it in a better way? Uh, if you can personalize it more to the people who are on the sociopathic uh, <laughs> spectrum, maybe that will help. I think that's a, that's a great question. I actually don't know. I, I mean, my, my, I guess my response in thinking of this is probably not in a lot of instances. I mean, if you're the head of a firm that has 100,000 employees and millions of clients, there's no way of, of making each one of those individuals come, uh, you know, you actually need to, to picture the people. This is what reporters, I'll say, this is what reporters, effective reporters do, is that when they talk about what's, I mean, we think of what happened in Aleppo. This is an issue that's been going on. We know every reporter's been trying. It was that image, I think, of the four-year-old boy that was on the cover of every international paper that spurred a much different discussion publicly. It's because you got to see one young child that was injured and had the blood all over his face. So this is a technique reporters try to do to get us, but I think in the business community, the nature of business is such that it's just increasingly distant and far away. So this is where almost recognizing that and designing systems, knowing that that's the case, strikes me as the way uh, forward. Um, so Jim, um, one question is what do um, your you know, various people in every department, what do they say when they do your book and, and your conclusion? Um, and then somewhat related to one question that I would have thought Nick would both um, ask is how do you prevent and how do you deal with sort of the then playing you and then kind of you know right. influencing They're criminals. Therefore, right. <laughs> So let me, the first question, uh, 
it's been interesting. Uh, I'll say it's been a range of reactions. Um, and that I, the thing I realized ahead of time, and I write on the second to last page, but I think I appreciate it more as I gave the individuals the copies of the book, is that no one sees themselves as, as the villain. If you actually talk to people that do insider trading, they say, you know what, what I did is it's not so bad because it, you know, I was trying to build a business that was on the side. It's the people who did financial fraud that are the real bad guys. They wrecked a firm. And you talk to people that do financial fraud, they say, well, at least I was trying to build a firm. It's the people that did Ponzi schemes who didn't even have an underlying business that were really bad. And if you talk to Ponzi schemers, they say, yeah, I lost a couple million, maybe a couple billion, but it's not as bad as the bankers in the last financial crisis that lost a trillion dollars and weren't prosecuted. <laughs> And that's very much the reaction that no one, I'll say no one likes to be compared to anyone else. And I think that's the part that I, I see now and that many people struggle. I mean, Madoff doesn't like to be compared to other people, even though you could say he's on the top of this pyramid. But being in the same context, no one wants insider training to be compared to someone from Enron. The Enron people don't want to be compared to, and I think that's the challenge. Um, so. Some people are still talking with me. Uh, <laughs> so, so that'll be interesting going forward. And some. I mean, some of the people, and, and something I'm spending time on now, it's interesting when people have these extraordinary things happen. They're, they're errors, significant errors, of how do you move forward. And some of the people have actually are starting to do impressive things going forward, but have had to recreate their life, which is actually really, really challenging. Um, and these people, I actually, I, I really <coughs> applaud because in some ways it's so extraordinarily difficult after you have these sanctions. Um, to your second question, which is a very good one. Uh, I mean. By definition, uh, most all the people in my book were criminals, which if you talk about a reliable subject, generally you don't go to criminals to, to find uh, a reliable. But even broader than that is we all have very poor memories. I mean, there's lots of evidence suggesting that if we try to recall <coughs> even, even our own behavior to the best of our ability, we're going to tell an imperfect history. So what I did do and spend time with is not talk just about individual, their own case, but let's talk about other people's cases. Let's talk about, actually I sent them syllabus for my class. They've read cases. They've read books. They've read, they've read a couple of Luigi's paper on how much fraud there is in the country. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, we were talking about other things to see how they would react to seeing this other. And this is, I thought, much more revealing as you see people, how they react in other, other situations. Um, frankly, in how they react to my book, I mean, that would, I guess, you can't put that in the book since by definition it's already out. But that's been, in some ways, actually quite interesting. And Actually, a number of people, I've had three people who were convicted of white collar crimes read my book who I didn't speak with. Um, and they seem to actually see it resonates with them. So it's a nice kind of out of sample uh, <laughs> white collar <laughs> criminal. Uh. <laughs> yeah. If we could make it more salient, so I think this goes back to a point Nick raised, if we could make it more salient, that would do a lot, uh, I think, do extraordinary things. The trick is how do we make it more salient? I mean, if we go on, how many people in here think that the SEC is, I mean, this is not even criminal, we're gonna go, that are gonna go in the finance industry and have the SEC come after them for something that might be wrong or, or engaging in misconduct. I would argue that there's not one person in here who thinks the SEC is gonna be looking at them five years down the road. My guess is if I could take a survey five years from now, I can guarantee there's someone here that's probably going to do something a little bit sketchy <laughs> from the SEC. <laughs> it's just going to happen. I mean, you're going to enter your, your, your thinking, and how I've thought about this is that the problem is we look at our decisions now that I would never do that because I'm bringing in our, your, your current norms and beliefs and values to their problem. But the trick is in five and ten years when you're in, uh, let's say, on a trading floor, you're not going to be bringing your current norms and values and beliefs, you're gonna be doing that with what you learn over the next five years, the values that you develop, the norms that you actually are, you bring up. And so that's a much harder question. I mean, when you see, and I'm sure you've seen maybe in the, the newspaper, all the traders that, for example, the exchange rate fixing, and they're joking. I mean, they're kind of giving each other high fives, Let's, I'm gonna give you a bottle of champagne. I mean, they're, they're laughing about doing things that are actually pretty blame misconduct. And the question is, I think, uh, all these are pretty well-intentioned people. They're the kind of people like, like everyone here, uh, like people like in my class. 
how do you go from that to joking about rigging an interest rate? Um, that has to do with your norms and values are going to change over time. And at that point in the future, how do you actually recall what you were thinking today? That's hard. With insider trading, this gets into some interesting territory. We could have a much longer conversation. Uh, because if my chapter on insider trading is, I'd say it's, trend, uh, it's treading very careful water about maybe not all of this is actually so bad. And it's funny, the interviews that I do, they actually, if you go back in the early 20th century, it was actually economists at the University of Chicago, which were actually the most vocal in saying all these insider trading rules actually should be kind of dispensed with. Um, so people see I have uh, my degree from here. And so, you know, <laughs> defend insider trading. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think this is where we see some of the rules that are designed are, uh, and I would say insider trading. When we look at regulators, they say the reason why we shouldn't have insider trading is because it's, it's harming investors on the other side of the transaction. And that's just wrong. I mean, every time a regular says that, which they say it every couple weeks in some press release, that's not... Correct. Uh, anytime anyone here that works at a hedge fund is trying to do that, that, that is your goal. You're trying to trade with people that have less information and, and try to have them lose. I mean, it's an option contract. They are going to lose money. You are going to gain money. Um, so there, the theory underlying why it's wrong is, is wrong. But that said, there are things like insider trading. Why it can be wrong is because you're actually misappropriating information. You're actually stealing. So if you think of insider trading as, as misappropriating information, you're stealing information, you can actually see that in some instances there's a very good reason why we don't want people doing it and why they should be prosecuted. We don't want people at Capital One taking confidential files and then trading in, a, in the evening themselves. That's misappropriating, that's stealing Capital One's information. But the other, uh, the other case, we can think of a lot of instances where actually having people trade on information that other people don't have actually is okay, makes a lot of sense, and this is why it's actually being litigated right now at the Supreme Court. Uh, at Supreme Court. The, the rules around insider trading are changing. Um, and prosecutors want them very broad. Um, I think a lot of other people want them more narrow. Uh, and I think we're seeing that. So it's an important, I think, really difficult question. Okay. That'll have to be the last uh, question. Thank you all for coming. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, Thanks for that. That was, that was great. Thank, thanks, Jack. Sure.